All right. Hey. And we are live. All right. Welcome. All two of you, three. All right, hey. we're picking oh. up. People are showing up. Nice. Welcome, welcome. Good afternoon. Good morning. Good night. Good day. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Yeah, but, uh, I like that oh, one. That's a good one. We can Buenos go forever dias. now. Yeah. <laughs> Just keep it. We're on a roll. Very good. Uh, we're going to wait just for a second here, let people kind of trickle in. But uh, welcome wherever you are. Yes. Hello. Thank you for joining us on this edition of Touch Makes Webinar Workshop. <laughs> You need like last time on Touch Mix yeah, right? webinar, like a, you know, just so we're people know gonna, what they missed. We're going to serialize these. And yeah. then preview for next time at the end. Previously of the end. on <laughs> Touch Mix webinar workshops. Uh, as people start coming in, um, I'm just going to introduce myself. Uh, my name is Jacob. I am the uh, train coordinator at QSC. So I'm just going to help moderate. Um, you won't hear a lot from me uh, except for right now, but uh, I'll be in the background just helping out. Uh, we also have Eric, who's going to be helping answer a lot of questions and helping Jason. Yeah, uh, how's it going, guys? I'm Eric, um, uh, applications engineer for uh, QSC support. So um, I'll be answering a lot of your guys' uh, questions that you post up in the Q&A. And uh, chances are I've probably talked to one of you guys on the TouchMix uh, Facebook group as well. So. Nice. Awesome. And then, of course, we have Jason. Hi, guys. You know. <laughs> just, just, you know, I'm here, too. <laughs> I'll be, I'll be doing a lot of talking. I'll be the one kind of run, running the presentation here, and Eric is gonna be, be uh, my my eyes and ears for you guys out there and, and and helping out with the questions and things like that that you guys have. Yeah, Jason's gonna be doing a lot of talking, um, but we do want to keep this engaging. We want you guys feel free to ask questions. So if you do have any questions, uh, we're not going to have the chat available, but we do have the Q&A available. So just go ahead and post your questions in the Q&A. Uh, there's also the ability to raise your hand. Um, but if you do raise your hand, know that we won't actually call on you unless you put your question in the Q&A. Um, we, we just want to see what you're going to ask. And we want to we wanna know where the question's headed and, uh, and how we can best answer it. Um, and also, uh, if you do have a microphone available and you do have a question to ask, that's great because uh, we may be able to unmute you and have you ask your question directly with Jason and kind of mm -hmm. create a back and forth conversation with you, uh, Jason and Eric. Absolutely. Um, We're also asking that um, any questions you do have just kind of stay on the topic today. Um, and today's topic is uh, recording, recording to a USB hard drive. So we're going to be talking a lot about uh, recording and, and playback and mix downs and extracting files and things like that. So um, please, uh, you know, keep your questions related to the topic. Um, just, uh, you know, we have some time, time constraints here. You know, we're, we're trying to run these things in about an hour. Um, and if we stray too much from the topic, you know, we can kind of lose, lose track of time here. Um, however, you know, if you do have, you know, pertinent questions that might be outside of the topic or, um, you know, if, if we, we were going to try to get to all your questions, but if, you know, if, if we don't get the opportunity to answer your question, we will be following up with people through email once the webinar is concluded. Um, additionally, we are offering, we will be offering the recording of this webinar um, once this is over. So um, what day is today? Tuesday. So probably uh, tomorrow afternoon, you'll get a follow up email saying, hey, thanks for joining. And you'll have a link to the, the recording so that you can watch the rewatch it at your leisure. Um, and maybe if you, if you weren't clear on certain parts or you miss certain parts or you come in late or something like that, or you have to leave early, you can kind of catch, catch up uh, whatever you missed. Um, yeah, and I think that's, that sets the stage. What do you think, so. Jacob? Is that, yeah. is that good? Yeah, maybe, uh, maybe we'll give you guys another reminder. Actually, you know what, um, Eric or Jason, if one of you guys wants to send that uh, support info to me, I can post that in the chat so it'll be available yep. through the rest of the, the webinar. Good idea. We'll get that to you. But other than that, yeah, I think we're cool. ready to go. Okay, well, let's go ahead and dive in here. I'm going to go back to this, actually. Um, so today we're talking about recording, as I mentioned already. Um, we're going to be looking at the recording feature, uh, specifically recording to a USB hard drive. Um, this is something that all three mixers in the TouchMix series can do. 
Uh, so we're going to kind of break it, break down um, the process of recording and, and playing back files and things like that. We're also going to be look at how to perform a two track stereo mix down on the mixer itself, as well as how to extract your recorded files from your hard drive once they're recorded. Um, and we're also going to take a look at kind of what the file structure looks like in terms of how the, your recordings are arranged on the drive um, and, and how the mixer stores them and things like that. So we're going to kind of get into all of that and hopefully give you a really good idea on, you know, how to how to get some really good recordings with this thing. Um, obviously, you know, recording is, you know, very useful in many situations. You can capture performances, um, you can capture rehearsals, um, you know, you can, you can kind of do a lot with recordings. Um, you can use it, you know, in, a, in more of a studio setting and record demos and things like that. Um, so it's, it's pretty cool to be able to do this and to be able to understand, you know, what kind of goes on with the recording and how to, how to get through these processes. Um, the first thing, uh, that we're going to talk about, though, is the hard drive. So we're, we're talking about recording to a hard drive. Um, the mixer itself does not ha have any internal memory. Um, so you do have to have a, um, a USB storage device connected to the drive or to the, the mixer. Um, and there are a couple of qualifications that the drive must meet in order to perform with the well to be able to keep up um, and record effectively. Um, and they're kind of outlined on the screen there for you to, to take in, but um, in general, um, we recommend a, an SSD hard drive versus um, an HDD, which is a, a hard disk, disk drive. So SSD is a solid state drive. It doesn't have any moving parts. It doesn't have it. It's not a spinning drive. Um, the reason we recommend that is because they are much faster. They're also more durable and reliable. Um, they usually have you know, a longer lifespan. And as a bonus, they're usually a lot more compact and portable. So that's, that's a nice feature because they don't have to have, you know, um, they're not motorized, they don't have any spinning moving parts, you know, they're, they're able to make these things uh, a pretty, pretty compact. Um, but in general, um, in order for a drive to keep up with the mixer at, at a recording speed, it must have a read and write speed of at least 130 megabytes per second. Um, and so most solid state drives, uh, have read and write speeds of multiple times that. Usually it's close to four or 500 megabytes uh, per second on those drives. Um, so just make sure you're kind of like checking out the specs on your drives. Um, if you are using a, a hard disk drive or an HDD, a spinning drive, it has to spin at 7,200 RPM. Um, that's a huge caveat for those. Um, and, the, you know, I will say there is um, a bit of a price difference between a hard disk drive and a solid state drive. So, um, you know, a lot of people might want to look towards that uh, hard disk drive just to save some money. Um, and, you know, that's fine. Uh, just kind of make sure that that drive is going to perform adequately. Make sure it's got the 7200 RPM speed and make sure it's got a read and write speed of at least 130 megabytes per second. Um, additionally, they need a USB 3 connection. Um, and we also recommend that they are no larger than uh, one terabyte in storage space. Um, it's just not necessary. And we found that um, drives that are over a terabyte in size um, tend to actually underperform uh, for whatever reason, just, just the, way, the way the mixer um, you know, handles that storage space um, just doesn't work very well. Um, but realistically, you don't need that much space. A 250 gigabyte or a 500, uh, 500 gigabyte hard drive is more than enough space. It's, it's very adequate. You can record for many, many, many hours on even just a 250 gigabyte hard drive. So go ahead and um, you know, kind of take a look at those. We do have some examples. We have um, run qualification processes on a number of drives out there on, on the market today. Um, and so that is the list. You can see that on my slide here. So there's it's about five drives that we have on, on our list right now that we have actually tested internally and we have, we're comfortable qualifying and supporting those drives to work with TouchMix. Um, I'll just go ahead and tell you my favorite one personally is the Samsung T5. Uh, that thing is just a powerhouse. Uh, I've been using it for a couple of years now and it's, it's fantastic. It's awesome. It's awesome. It's awesome. Um, so that would be, you know, my recommendation, but any of the drives on that list would work. Um, if you just want to go and find one of those, if not, if you kind of want to shop around on your own, just kind of be conscious of these requirements that the drive have to meet and be taking a look at the specifications and make sure you get one that is going to meet these requirements. Um, last, the drive must be formatted to FAT32, specifically FAT32, not XFAT. Um, so this is a very specific file format that the drive must be formatted in. 
Um, the mixer itself, and the first thing we're going to get into once I um, get, uh, move over to my mixer here, is I'm going to show you how to format the drive from the mixer itself. It's pretty awesome. You can do it right from your touch mix, uh, so you don't have to worry about it. Um, addition, I mean, if you're going to do it from your computer, if you have a Mac, um, the Mac disk utility can format um, FAT32 natively. A uh, Windows computer, however, does not have uh, that option of the FAT32 format option natively, so you'll need to download a third party um, utility to do that. Um, if you just do a web search for FAT32 format utility, you'll get a whole bunch of hits. There's a bunch of free ones. They're all pretty simple to use. Um, but, you know, if you don't want to do that, the mixer does it for you. So that's pretty awesome. Um, and actually, I'll go ahead, if you would like a little bit more information on this, Jacob, I'm going to send you something I should have done this earlier. Uh, just give me one second. Uh, I'm going to have Jacob post the um, link to our qualified drives page and our hard drive information page. So here you go, Jacob. I just sent that to you. If you could post that in the chat, um, you guys feel free to navigate to that page. And then there's a lot more information on hard drives there. So that's kind of a high level overview on hard drives. Um, there you go. So now once we've got a drive picked out and we know what works, we can go ahead and use it with our mixer here. Now, um, one last thing I will say before I move on is um, we don't really recommend or, or really support thumb drive recording. And the reason for that is there are, there's a, a very wide variety of thumb drives that are on the market and they come in all different types and sizes and speeds and functions. And um, it's, it's extremely difficult to try and qualify them because it's sort of like the wild west. Um, so I'm not saying hard drives don't work. I'm saying a lot of hard drives don't work. Some of them do, however. So uh, if you really want to be able to record on a hard drive, um, see if you can find one that still meets kind of the specifications that I've outlined. Um, and then um, really with any drive, but particularly a, a thumb drive, if you're going to be using that, test it first before you actually go and record whatever your event is. Um, and you need, you need to be able to rely on that. So just kind of test it beforehand. And if it, if it works, great. Um, if not, you know, keep trying until you find one that does. Um, so there you go. There's, hard, there's thumb drives and hard drives. Let's go ahead and take a look at the mixer. So here's my, my mixer screen here. It's my main mix. Um, we're gonna go ahead and go straight to the recording feature, which you can access by pressing the record play button right here. That's gonna take you to the recording screen. And depending on which model you have, you have a couple of different options. So on all three models, you have this option. This is the, um, this is the multi-track to USB screen. You, it looks like you have a little recording transport right down there. We'll talk about that in a minute. Um, if you hit this record mode button right here, that's gonna bring up your, your options. On the TouchMix 8 and the TouchMix 16, um, you will have this multi-track USB option as well as the stereo MP3 option. So the mixer is capable of playing MP3s um, directly from a hard drive. Um, and then on the TouchMix 30, you will have this additional mode, which is multi-track DAW mode. So you can connect the TouchMix 30 directly with the computer and use that as a DAW interface. Um, we're going to be talking about that feature um, in detail on Friday. So um, if you're not doing anything Friday morning, come back and check that one out. That's going to be really cool. Um, so we're going to just select this for now, multi-track USB. And that's going to get us on this screen. So this is our our main recording screen. This is where we're going to want to be to be um, performing our, our recording and, and starting and stopping and things like that. Um, before we start recording, uh, I'm going to take us into the record setup. And that's located right here, right under the record mode button, on the lower uh, right hand side of the transport there. So we press that, that takes us into our recording setup screen. There's a number of things we can do in here. Um, primarily, we can access any of our recording sessions. We can also um, create new sessions and rename sessions and things like that. So um, sessions are, are a really great way to organize your recordings. Um, so you can create as many recording sessions as you want. So you can, you can create a session um, for an entire event or an entire show or an entire rehearsal. Um, or maybe if you're, you're doing a festival type of event or if you have multiple acts you know, throughout the length of the event, you can make a new recording session for each band or each act. Um, you could make new sessions for each individual song. Um, so kind of, you know, it's at, it's at your disposable, disposable, disposal to set however many you need. Um, and it's very simple to do. Um, the first thing I'm going to do before we get into all that, you can, you can see I've already kind of been doing some recording on this particular drive, but I'm going to go ahead and actually format this drive just so you, you get a clear idea of how, how that works. And 
Um, what's actually going to happen is it's going to erase this drive and I'm fine with that because I've backed up these things elsewhere. Um, but it is um, very, very um, good to know that anytime you format a drive, whether it's on the mixer or on your computer, um, it's going to erase all the contents of that drive and then reformat it into the desired format. So let's go ahead and perform our format. Step one. And that is done with this button right down here where it says format USB drive. So it's got, I've got my drive connected. Um, and if your drive is already formatted to FAT32, it, you know, you'll, you'll, if, and if you already have been recording, you'll see your scenes here. At the very least, it will automatically write this default scene. So if you connect a drive and you come in here and you already see the default um, scene there that it has created, that means that it is already formatted correctly and it has created that default scene for you upon connection. Um, but we're going to pretend that we need to format this thing. I'm going to just hit this button, format USB drive, and then I confirm it by hitting format on this prompt here. Now it gives me a little warning. It's going to start recording. Now I'm, it as, it's asking me not to unplug it. And now it's saying that it is, here we go, in format, in, in process, do not remove. So the, the first warning was basically telling you, hey, just so you know, this is going to erase all the contents of your drive. And now there we go. USB drive successfully formatted. Okay. Hey, Jason. That was easy. Yeah. Um, we, got a, we got a question. Um, can the uh, mixer format FAT32 larger than 32 gigabytes? Yes, absolutely. So the 32 is not indicative of um, how much space it, it needs or, or it's going to place. Um, I mean, I, honestly, I don't know what the, the number 32 is in reference to in that format. But no, you can, you can format any size. Um, the, what it will do, though, is within, and it's not, um, it's, it's not going to like build part partitions in your drive. It'll format your whole, your whole drive, no matter how large the drive is. Um, but there is a file length limitation. Um, I was going to talk about that later, but I'll go ahead and just throw, that, throw it out of that now. Um, so within the FAT32 file format, any single file that is on that drive cannot exceed two gigabytes. So any single file cannot be larger than two, gigab two gigabytes. For most things, that's fine. And um, where the mixer is concerned, it is actually also still fine. What that means is once your recording file, once an individual recording file um, reaches two gigabytes in size, the mixer will issue you a little warning. And so, hey, you're, you're reaching, you're getting close to that two gigabyte file size limitation. Um, we recommend that you go ahead and stop, stop your recording at the next, you know, um, convenient time or the, at the next time, the, the next time that makes sense and just simply restart it. That's all you have to do. If you did, if you hit stop and then restart your recording, it just, can, it starts writing brand new files and then you can, you can keep going. If you do, if you get that warning and you choose not to stop it, once you hit that two, two gigabyte um, length limitation, the mixer will automatically stop and restart the recording for you. Um, so you don't actually have to do it manually. Um, it just gives you the prompt. So if there is a specific spot, you know, that you, you want to choose to stop and start recording that this may be more convenient or maybe it makes sense. Um, you can do that. Otherwise, the mixer will do it on itself. Um, but it's possible that it, it, it could happen in the middle of a song or in the middle of a lecture or something like that. Some at a time that might not be the most convenient to have a gap. Um, so there you go. That was a fantastic question. Um, yeah, no, no size limitation on the drive with the format, but there is a file limitation. I hope that, hope that was clear for you. Um, thank you for that. And I'll go ahead and keep going here. So you can see now I've success, successfully formatted my drive. It's erased the, the recordings I had on there previously, and now I'm just left with my default recording uh, session. Now I am able to record directly into this session if I want to, um, or I can go ahead and create my own session or my own number of sessions. And to do that, we're just going to go ahead and hit new session right there. There's a button right here next to rename. We hit the new session button. We click into the name field there and I can clear that default name out and I can name it whatever I want. I can say Jason's recording. I'm very creative. There we go. Now I've named it. Now I can hit the, the green create button and then I'll confirm that. And now you, you can see there, now I've got my brand new session. And it also, in my current session field right up here, uh, it's telling me that that is currently recalled. So I'm going to be recording into this session that I just created. Um, the last thing I want to point out on the screen before we jump back to the recording screen is the pickoff point here. Uh, so when you are recording onto the hard drive, you are recording directly from the mixer preamps um, so by default, it's going to be set to pre here, which is just a dry signal directly from your preamp onto your 
uh, hard drive. So that's just, it's, it's gonna record, uh, it's gonna record wave files, by the way, 32-bit um, um, uncompressed wave files. Um, and so each channel that you record, it's gonna be writing wave files, dry direct from the preamp. So none of the processing on the board is going to get captured. Um, it's also good to know that because the preamp level itself, so your trim knob is actually dictating the level of your recorded files. So you want to make sure if you participated in a few webinars back on the proper gain structure one, um, you know, that, that whole process of, of figuring out your gain structure is going to be really advantageous to recording as well. Because if you've got that optimal level in your preamps, you know, you're go and, and you're recording at the same time, you know, you're going to be getting, you know, um, the best recording level that you can get. So make sure that your preamps are dialed in and you're going to get that recording level. Um, pre records completely dry. If you switch this to post, um, it will capture the EQ and the dynamics of your channel processing. So all of your EQ for each channel and any um, compression or gating that you have on those channels as well will also get captured. It will never capture effects. The multi-track mode don't capture the effects at all on the channels. Um, but there is a two-track record mode, um, which we'll get into in a minute, that does give you the ability to record effects. So it's basically recording an entire mix versus individual channels. Okay, cool. That's our um, screen, our recording setup screen. I'm gonna leave that on pre. I'm gonna press record play again to exit back out to my recording screen. So now I'm all set up. I've got my scene created and I can see that in there. Um, and now all I need to do is select which tracks I wanna be recording and set them to arm. So you'll notice here up on all of your channel faders, you have a couple of additional buttons than you do on your main screen. If I go back to my main home screen, I've got my large faders here and I've just got my mute buttons at the bottom. In the record play, I have access to my arm and my track button. So any channels I want to be recorded, I set them to arm just like this. And I can do this for any and all channels on the mixer and each channel that I set to arm will be recorded individually. So it is full multi-track and then in my last bank here, here I have my, my stereo record option, which we'll touch on in just a minute. So once everything is armed, all I have to do is press record and I will be off and running. And I'm gonna just do a little silly test. I do have a microphone connected into one of my inputs here. Check, check, hello. You can see the, I've got my level here. So I'm just gonna go ahead and record a few seconds of my voice. So I've got that armed. I don't need everything else armed. So I'm actually gonna, Go ahead and unarm all of these. But you know, had I, if this were a, you know, a full 24 track mix, I could arm all my channels and be recording all of those individually. Um, okay, so now I've got my channel armed. I've got level coming in. I've got my recording session set up. If I just hit the record button, now I am recording. You can see that the record play button illuminates in red to let you know that you are actively recording even if you leave the recording screen. So if I'm mixing and I'm punching around the board and I see that lit up, I know that I am recording whatever's happening right now. Um, I'll, and then back in here, we can see that the timeline has jumped over to the right here. The playhead has jumped over there and then my, my timer is, is actively running. So it's counting down um, to my recording. And here we go and I've, uh, so I've got a few seconds. I've got 30 seconds of a recording here. I'm gonna go ahead and stop that. Um, now I can play that back if I want to. Um, so all of the controls you see here um, are relatively self-explanatory if you've ever used you know, any kind of recorder or recording software before. We've got our record button here and our stop button and we've got our play button. So if we wanna just play back our recordings, um, we've got our scroll forward and backward buttons. And then this button uh, is a return to zero button. Um, so that will reset the playhead all the way to the zero position. Otherwise I can grab the playhead with my finger and I can slide it you know, up and down the timeline if I wanna select a certain spot to play back from. Um, or I can engage my back button and then just stop that when I find where I want to go or my forward button and it will sc scroll, scroll the playhead automatically in either direction. Um, so let's go ahead and play this back. I'm going to return that to zero. To play your tracks back directly from the mixer, you're going to want to unarm any tracks that you want to, to listen back to. And then we're going to engage the track button, which is right above the arm button. You'll notice when I engage that, the arm button disappears. Um, and now we know my channel is in track mode. If you go back out to your home screen, you'll also see this icon right here. Whoops, stick, stick to my main mixer. Um, the, little, the little play icon appears on your channel. Any channel that is set to track, that icon will be there. And that is to indicate, that is to let you know that, hey, this channel is set to playback. So it's going to be playing back 
tracks off of a drive um, and it is not using the preamp as its source anymore. So anything that is connected, actively connected to that channel, you will not hear out of that channel while it's in track mode. And then- Hey, Jason. Yes. Um, question, we got a couple of people that hit, they're asking the same question. Is there a way to um, arm and uh, to group the arm and track buttons together? Group them together. So that um, you don't have to basically, so you don't have to. Arm so you don't have to like hit individual. every single one. Yes, there is. There is a really cool way to do that. So you can set up a user button. Actually, um, this will be a slight tangent, but this will be really fun. I'll show you this. So if you have user buttons on the eight and sixteen. You'll you'll have four user buttons around your wheel here. On the TouchMix thirty here, you have a couple of additional user buttons. You have eight user buttons total. You have an additional four up above here. Um, so you can set up user buttons to arm all tracks and track all tracks. Um, and it's, it's really cool to do that. I'll, I'll show you how that works really quickly. Um, we're going to, to the menu here, I'll press menu, and then you're going to select user buttons on the menu screen here. And now in here, we have access to all of our user buttons and this is how we can set them up and assign them. Um, for simplicity and speed here, I'm just gonna go ahead and say, I'm gonna set U1 and U2 up for these tasks. I'm gonna set U1 to arm all my track tracks and I'm gonna set U2 to track all my tracks. Um, so U1, I want it to be arm. So on my menu here, and I'll get a little closer so you can read that a little easier. Here we go. I'm gonna go to the recording option in my first, my action column here. And then in my middle column, I'm going to select do for all tracks. And then in the detail column, I'm going to select toggle arm. And then I'm just going to hit the screen assign button and confirm that. Now you can see the name of my uh, user button as well as the user button tab itself are renamed to that function toggle arm. Now, if I go back to my record screen and I hit U1, bam, all of my tracks or all of my channels are now armed. Now, I'm gonna go back into my user button setup. I'm gonna to go to user button two, and I'll go to recording. I'll go to do for all tracks, toggle mic track. I'll say assign, just same process I did to set up the first one. I'm just selecting the, the different option there. And now I've got toggle all arm and toggle all tracks. We can see that in the tabs there. Going back to my recording screen, if I hit U2, now they're all set to track. So that is a really, really neat shortcut. That was. A, Great question. Thank you for asking that. Um, very cool. I'm going to leave that like that actually for the rem remainder of this session because that's really useful. So now in track mode, uh, I'm set to playback and I've only got one recorded file, but that's fine. Um, I'm just going to pull that up a little bit and I'll give you my mix here. So you can hear that. And you should hear me talking. Nope, we don't hear me talking. Did I route this? Hmm. Well, that's, I wonder if I disconnected it. Well, I promise you what's happening. You can, you can still see that the movement there on the fader. I'll, I'll see if I can troubleshoot that in a second. Uh, nonetheless, I am playing my track back and that should be going out to you but it is not. Anyway, um, that is basically how you record. I just, so I've just recorded a few seconds of my voice and I was able to play that back. Um, we did see, you know, when I played that back, I'll right reset that again and hit play. You know, there is audio happening on that channel, which is since my main channel fader is up, it is going to the main output there and taking it to our loudspeakers or our listening source or wherever that is. So it's as simple as that. That is um, how to record and then you can stop and then Record again. Um, every time you do hit stop and record again, so we need to be in arm. So make sure that in between listening to your recordings and then going, if you're going to record more, um, you're you're going back and forth between arm and track for any tracks that you're working with. Um, you don't you can't record any channels if they're set to track or or on not set to arm. Um, now I could if I wanted to keep going. Um, let's say. Uh, I've created my session and my, my plan is I've created this session to record an entire um, set of a band and I'm going to, but I'm going to stop the recording after each song and then restart it when they start each song. So I have different tracks within my session for each song. It just kind of, again, helps with organization. Every time you stop the recording and hit record again, it does start writing brand new files within that same recording session. 
Um, and that'll make a little more sense when we take a look at uh, what the file structure looks like. Um, um, otherwise, um, if, you, if you don't want more than one recording to, or, or multiple recordings to kind of stack up within a single session, you can just be creating new sessions and, you know, as often as you want to. So if you just want a, you know, single, a single session for each individual song or, or, or more, more granular um, organization of your recorded files and you don't want a bunch of files within a single session, just go ahead and just keep creating new ses sessions and sessions and sessions, as many as you want. Um, let's go ahead and talk about the stereo record now. Um, so what I just showed you is, is a very, very rudimentary and simple example of the multi-track record mode. I clearly only recorded a single channel, but the process is, is the same. You know, just arming all of your channels and then they will all be recorded. Um, the stereo option is a little bit different. Um, that, and that is found here. So if you navigate to your stereo in dash uh, two track bank here, which is after your, all of your input channels um, on your eight or your 16, you know, this will be fo following the, the fader in the input bank respectively. Um, and it's located right here. So you have a record channel. So all of the audio from your main channel by default is being delivered into your record channel. So what this is, is basically a, just a, a stereo recording of your main output. And so if you need that, if you just want to record whatever your main mix is and get a stereo recording of that, this is your option. All you have to do is arm that. And then when you hit record, that begins to record and your main mix is, is being recorded. And now it is a two, it's called two tracks. So it's a stereo recording, um, but it is two tracks. So you actually have a left and a right file. They're two separate files. Um, and you can export those uh, later, you will see them separately, and then you can put them in a DAW and you know, condense them and, and export them as a single stereo file. Um, or if you go into the channel itself by, by touching the, the blank gray area where a name of a channel would normally exist, um, you know, touch that up there, you can access the setup screen for your two track channel. And you have this option here, which is really nice. You can actually export your two track um, recording as a single MP3 file, a stereo MP3. So if you can export that right from the board, um, that's a fine option for you. Sticking with the screen for a second, you still have the, the same um, recording pickoff options here. Um, for the most part, you're probably going to want to actually have this set to post. When that's set to post, you are recording the, the true mix, whatever the true mix of your main output is. So all your fader levels, all of your processing, all of your effects, you know, exactly what you're hearing on your main mix is recorded and captured on this mix. And that is, um, it is going to capture all of your processing and your effects anyway. Um, the post option is actually your fader option. So it's, when you set this to post, it's post fader. So we'll, you will actually hear all of the movement in your channel faders. If you set that to post, then it's still kind of more or less direct from the preamp as far as the level, you know, but it will capture all of your processing as well. The other nice thing in here is you can actually change the recording source. So by default, as I said, it's recording your main left and right. Um, you have the option, however, on all three mixers. Now this, the, your option here will vary depending on what mixer you have. Um, on my TouchMix 30 here, the, the second option, it would be AUX 13 and 14. So if I were to, that's kind of off screen there, my apologies. If I were to go into AUX 13 or 14 and link the two together to create a stereo uh, pair out of those two channels, I can now use that as my recording source and I can create an, a completely independent mix of my main mix for my stereo recording instead of using the main mix. Um, so if I were to just go into AUX 13 here and go to my setup screen, enter into the main output of 13. And on the setup screen, I have a link option and that will link my two auxes together. All of the auxes link in obvious pairs, what we call obvious pairs. So one and two link together, three and four link together and so on and so forth. You can't link two and three together, for example. So it is kind of that obvious paired paradigm. Um, so I can link 13 and 14 together to create a single stereo um, output there and then use that for my, whoops, wrong channel, for my source on my stereo recording. Now, if I go into this aux, I can create a completely independent mix um, or custom mix that is different or varied slightly from my main mix. Um, the reason you might want to do this is if you're recording an event um, and there are certain components on the stage that are lower in the main mix because there's enough stage volume to 
you know, to get it loud enough in the room itself. Uh, for instance, just, just an example, uh, and a musical example would be um, a venue, a, a smaller kind of club size where you've got, you know, a guitar cabinet up on stage and the volume of the cabinet itself is, is pretty adequate to get for, you know, for supplying that sound to the room, to the audience that's actually there. So in the main mix, you might have the guitar channel you know, just kind of barely, barely in the mix, just, just a little, a little bit, you got it mic'd anyway, and you say you're, you're giving it a little bit of the mix, but for the most part, you're, it's, it's absent. Um, and if you were to record that, your guitar channel will be very, very, very faint in the mix, in that stereo mix, and that's not good. So you can set up your aux as such, and then you can get the guitar level to an adequate recording speed for your stereo recording. So it sounds good in the room to the people, and it sounds good on your recording, and everything sounds level and balanced. So that's one of the reasons um, you might want to use the aux as your recording source as opposed to the main mix. So it's a pretty cool option that you have. Um, OK. Now, if you want to hear this back, so here's our, our channel here. I'll get back out here. So this will be recording. At any point, if you wanted to hear back what's on this channel, and you, could, you would scrub your playhead to the position that you wanted to listen back from. You would unarm that, and then you would simply move this fader up. So this channel here, this adjacent channel that is in, called, um, sorry, two-track PB, that stands for playback. So this is actually a dedicated playback channel for your stereo recording. So whatever's recorded through your stereo channel here will play back through this channel when you hit uh, play here and get, so you can get some level up in there. So that's how you listen back to your stereo files on the mixer itself. Um, another really, really cool option of this stereo recording is you can use this feature to mix down a multi-track recording. So, or you can use it at the same time. So you don't have to be multi-track or stereo. So you can arm everything. You can arm all your multi-track channels and arm your stereo and capture all your channels individually, plus a stereo recording of your main mix or your aux mix or whatever you want. Um, additionally, you can use them together to mix down a multi-track recording. So if I had, let's say I had recorded a full multi-track uh, mix down here, I've got, I've got a bunch of channels recorded. Um, now I want to track them all or, or uh, sorry, yeah, track them all. I'm done tracking, I've got all my recordings done. So I set all my channels to track and then over in my, uh, stereo channel here, I arm that. So my individual tracks are set to arm, my stereo channel is set to, uh, sorry, reverse that. My individual channels are set to track, my stereo channel is set to arm. Now if I kind of just reset the playhead by scrubbing it back or hitting the return to zero button, I can hit play and then record. My tracks will start to play back and the stereo uh, channel will be recording and it will be recording, you know, your, your mix of your Multi, your multi-track recording. Um, you do need to have a mix, so you'd want to kind of build a fader mix and maybe get some processing. So if you did, you know, record everything multi-track, like I said, it's more or less recording those things dry. If you wanted to actually use the mixer processing to mix those down right on the mixer itself and, and then re-record re that as a stereo recording, you could do so. Um, and it's as simple as tracking all of those channels, coming into your mix, um, you know, applying whatever processing is necessary, applying your effects, um, you know, getting your, your fader balance and then hitting play on your, on your playback tracks and uh, record and, you, and then it'll, 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 you've just mixed down your stereo recording directly on the mixer, which is pretty cool. Um, okay, I'm going to go ahead and show you what these look like once you've recorded. Uh, actually, before I leave my mixer here, I, I actually, I'll, I'll touch on one more thing. Um, there are a number of people who uh, have used this more or less as a tape machine to try and, um, you know, more and more in a studio environment. Um, and they want to perform overdubs. And overdub, you know, just if you, you laid down, you know, a, a track, you tracked a song, but there were maybe there was a section of the song where you made a mistake or you didn't like your performance as much, you can go back and kind of just record over that section. You liked the rest of it, you just want to redo a part. So you just kind of do an overdub and you, you re-record over that section. Um, you can do that on the touch mix, um, sort of. <laughs> Um, what happens is, um, first of all, the process would look like this. Um, similar to doing a, a stereo recording, you know, you would set all of your playback channels, all the channels that you want to play along to that maybe have already been recorded. You set those to track, so those, those will play back, and then whatever channel you're going to re-record over, 
you would take that off of track and then set that to arm. So let's, let's say you want to redo your guitar solo or something like that. You set the rest of the band tracks to track and then you set your guitar channel back to arm. Um, you find the, that section of the song on your playhead here um, and then scoot it back a few seconds so you have a little bit of a lead in time to kind of set yourself up to get into the part. And then the same thing, you would just hit play and record. It's gonna play back your tracks so you can listen and play along to and then it's going to be recording your, your channel or re-recording your channel. Um, but what it's doing um, it, in, in a, a typical overdub um, is actually the tape machine or you know, the DOS software or whatever you're using is actually overwriting the same recording file. So you're, you're erasing what you previously had recording in that take and putting something new there. Yeah, um, so you're, you're replacing it. TouchMix doesn't do that. Um, it's, not, it's not a true overdub. It's actually re just recording a new file in that spot. That, and when you play that back, if you were to then, want, if you wanted to listen to that performance, you would reset that to track, find the spot in the playhead again, hit play, you know, and then you would hear the newer um, recording back come in at that, one, at that part. The old part is still there. And that'll make more sense when we start looking at the, the file structure. Um, and so in fact, let's actually do that now. I'm gonna jump over real quick to my PowerPoint here. And I wanna show you this. So this is what happens when you do an overdub. This is a little graphic that I put together. Um, so you can see here, this is, I said this, call this a track. This is one, one track. You know, your recorded content gets recorded here. So here's your original recorded file, looks like that. And this section in here, you didn't like, so you want to punch in and overdub it. So you set your playhead to about here. You set yourself up, you hit play, you hit record. Now you're recording this. So here's your overdub. So it's a, it's a separate file that within the timeline of the mixer, you know, it is, it is going to be placed appropriately in the timeline so that if you were to then play this back, you know, you would be listening to the recording, you're playing back, you're playing back, you're playing back, and then you get to this section, it jumps over and it starts playing back your newer recording. Because of that, when you get to that little section, you, you do hear a little pop because of the file changeover in that instance. Um, and the pop actually is, is present in the actual recorded file. It's another reason why you wanna kind of set, set your, your recording spot um, a few seconds before the section you actually wanna record. Because if you were going to pull these files into a DAW um, and edit them later and mix them down that way, um, you, you, you are actually probably going to need to kind of snip off or, or add a little fade up to that file. In addition to having to um, place that file appropriately in your timeline, you will have to line that file up because the file is much smaller and it was recorded very specifically in that one spot on the mixer. Once you get the files out into your computer, you, you are, your timeline is all out of alignment and you're going to need to line that overdub file up with your um, with the rest of your channels in its appropriate spot. So just some information on overdubbing. You can do it. Um, there are some caveats to it. Um, so just understand that that's how it works. And if you want to do it, great. Um, but that's how it works. Cool. So that is our, um, our you know, recording function for the most part. Now let's take a look at what happens on the drive. I'm going to actually switch over to my desktop at this time. There we are. Got a little window there. Cool. So I have um, a drive connected to my mixer with a bunch of recordings on it. So if I open my, my file here, I can navigate to my USB drives. So that, there we go. There's my TM30 drive labeled appropriately. If I click that, this is what your recorded sessions are going to look like. So I've got a number of sessions in here. It's a very active recording. Um, and so you got your, your initial session folders, which contain all of your actual recordings. And then you also have these files. These are header files that the mixer writes every time you create a new session. And this is how the mixer plays your tracks back. This, is, this contains metadata that allow the mixer to play back your channels. And that's important in a minute. I'm going to just show you. Um, so this, this actually, this first one here was recorded on a TouchMix 16. So if I open this, this is what you get. You get individual track folders. So I got one through 22 on a TouchMix 16 because I have 16, uh, the 16 initial mic, microphone mic line channels plus my stereo inputs, right? I have a number of stereo inputs on a 16, which takes me to 20. So two stereo channels there, which I can also record. And then 21 and 22 
are going to be your two-track playback recording. So your left and your right channel for your stereo record option end up in the very last folders here, 21 and 22. So that's where those are located. And if you click in here, there you go. There's your wave files. There's your recorded wave files. And this one, uh, this session I've actually been working with, I've manipulated it a little bit. So you'll see it actually has um, a naming scheme. Um, if I go out real quick, this section here, this is, this is, a, is a direct recording. So this was recorded directly off of my mixer and I haven't touched it, I haven't manipulated it at all. Check this out. Um, so this is a TouchMix 30 recording session. So I do have 32 total track folders here. And if I go into track one, my recording file is just called region one. And if I go into track two, that recording file is also called region one. So this is how the, rec how the, the mixer records. So it's A, you know, it records, it um, creates a folder for all of your sessions. Then within each session folder, you have your individual track folders, which are going to contain all of your actual recorded WAV files for anything you've recorded on those channels. Um, and then it's just going to label them very generically, region one, region two, region three, and so on, however many recordings you have within that session that you're just gonna fill up. But every single channel, they're all going to be labeled the same. It does not delineate between channels. So if you wanted to extract these channels from your drive, um, you could do so manually simply by grabbing each track Kind of, I'll drag it onto my desktop just to show it. Um, or you could, you know, you could clearly kind of choose a more specific destination on your computer that you want to save this to. Um, once you've, you know, placed it somewhere, you have a file called Region One. Now, if you want to go into your second track, you have another file called Region One. Once you, put, if you put that in the same location on your computer system, your computer is, doesn't know what to do with that. It doesn't like files that have the exact same name. So you do have to rename them as you go. Um, and kind of my workflow is, I'll, I'll pull one out. And whoops, I don't want to play it. Um, and I'll just name it. I know what my channels were on my mixer. I know my channel one was my kick, so I can just label that kick. Now, if I go into my channel two, I can pull out that one and I can name that one snare and I can do that, you know, for all of my channels, if you want to do it that way, there's an easier way to do it. And I highly recommend doing it this way instead of this. Uh, we have a really neat utility. It is a free download on qsa.com. It's called the DAW Utility. And it looks like this, kind of hanging off the edge of my screen a little bit there, that's fine. Um, but this is the DAW Utility. You have two modes. You have a TouchMix to DAW mode, as well as a DAW to TouchMix mode, um, which is really, really nice because this allows you to, to go the other way. So this one is an extraction tool. Um, if you're going from TouchMix to DAW, you're going to basically select a, a recording session on, on your hard drive, and it is going to do a batch export for you going to take all of those tracks, all of those files, and it's going to save them somewhere on your system that you'd specify and automatically pull all those files off of it in one go and put them in one place on your computer. So it's much more efficient than going through each one, uh, one by one. And to do this, first you kind of your, you select your drive here. So up in the touch mix drive field at the very top, you see that I've selected that there. You select, you know, whatever drive your recordings are on. In this case, I know it's my drive E. So I can select that. Um, now, since there are TouchMix recordings on that drive, in the session field here, if I click that, there they are. All of my TouchMix recording sessions are showing up there, so I can choose which one I want to extract. I'm going to select this, this one here. And now, as soon as I select that, look at all of my channels came to life here. So now it, it, it was able to look into that session and say, oh, yeah, look, I've got all these recordings on all these channels. Um, you're going to want to give this a name. So the name field is specifying the name of the folder on your computer system or the name of the, the session. It's, it's going to kind of wrap everything in a new folder. It's going to write a new folder and put all these tracks in a folder and you just tell it what name you want to give it. So I can say uh, 2EO uh, export, that should work. And now we're going to tell it where we want to save it. Um, and just to show you that again, that's the destination field. I can either click directly into the field like that and it will pull up a finder window so I can direct, you know, I can fig find where I want to place this. I can just say my desktop da, 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 and I can say select folder. So good. So I know I'm going to save it to my desktop. I know it's going to name it 2EO export. I know I'm pulling my files from the 2EO session on my drive. Now my last option here is the ex export format. It will default to 32 bit because that is how they are recorded by the mixer, you have the option to change this to 24-bit or float. 
Um, now, there are some, if your intention is to pull these files into a DAW software to edit and mix down, um, this might be a really, really good option for you because there are some DAW softwares that will not accept a 32-bit file. Um, I know in particular, Logic Pro, um, it doesn't, or at least it didn't used to, it, 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 they might have updated it, but um, for a long time, it would not accept a 32-bit file. So you would have to convert your files to 24-bit to get them into that particular software. With this tool, you can do that automatically. So I can select 24-bit integer if I want to do that. And now, on all of my tracks, I can either start clicking each channel individually. So if there are specific channels that I want to, to extract, or if I don't need all of them, I can select them individually, or I can hit this all button right over here. And it will automatically select all of my tracks. Um, you have a couple of options. If you have stereo, if you've recorded any of your stereo channels, including your, um, your stereo recording bus, you have the option of changing those from stere stereo files to dual mono, dual mono. So that's a nice option. Otherwise, if you leave this in stereo, um, you know, your, your, this utility will actually take your two, your, those two files, your left and your right file and merge them into a single um, stereo file. Or if you can leave them dual mono if you wanna do that. Uh, and then the last step here is once I've got everything selected, I just hit the export button like that and I confirm. And then it gives me this and it starts to export all of my channels. This usually takes a few minutes. You can see it got through all of my stereo channels really quickly because there's probably nothing there. Um, but now it's, it's going through all of my actual regions. Um, and I'm actually not going to let this finish. I've already done this. I just wanted to show you the process here. I'm gonna cancel this um, and minimize that for a second. And if I grab this right here, this is the same session that I exported previously just so I could show it to you. So we didn't have to sit there and wait for it to actually work. If I now open this folder, however, there we go. I have all of my tracks and look, they are named. So the utility will automatically name each track based on whatever name it was given in the mixer. So if you had named all your channels in the mixer, that name will be applied to all of your recorded files if you export them with the utility. Even if you didn't name them, the default channel names on TouchMix are in one, in two, in three, and so on. You know, even that will be different than a whole bunch of files called region one. So the utility is, is, is gonna apply those names um, and just make the whole export process very smooth and very easy. So I highly, highly recommend you go download this guy right here. It's on, it's on our website. You can find it. Um, there's a link. If you navigate to the TouchMix landing page on qsc.com at the very bottom, there is a link. And I'll, I'll get that in a second. And I'll have Jacob post that at the end here so you guys can check that out. Um, cool. So now let's take a look at going the other way. So let's say I have some WAV files that I did not record using TouchMix, but it would be really great if I could use the mixer to play them back. Um, inherently, um, or, or nat naturally, I guess, the mixer can only play back files that it has recorded um, because it, again, it captures certain metadata and then it, it writes a header file that it uses to be able to play those back out of their session folders. Without that header file, um, it doesn't know what to do with WAV files. It, it won't recognize them. So um, the utility has the option of going the other way. It will, it will write a touch mix session and, it, and you can put whatever wave files you want in that session and they will be played back on the mixer. So to, as an example, let's take a look here. I have a session on my desktop. I'll minimize a couple things. Actually, I don't need, yeah, it's fine. Um, I've got this folder right over here. Uh, if I open that, we've got a whole bunch of wave files in here. Now I was, uh, editing these tracks in a DAW software called Reaper. And so you can see Reaper uh, writes these peak files here for, for all the waves that it's working with in a, in a session here. So I've got a bunch of kind of different kinds of files here, but I do have all my wave files in this folder. And I want to take these tracks now and put them on a drive because I want to play them on my mixer. You can do this for backing tracks or break music or you know, whatever, you know, whatever your application might be, but it's really cool to be able to do this. So here's my session. Here's my, here are my tracks that I want to put on a drive. So I'm going to get my utility and in the source field, I'm going to select that folder on my desktop. It was called Brown Bottle Tracks. So I'll select that. Now, instantly, it recognizes that there are WAV files in this uh, folder and it kind of sets them all up. 
Um, this one, I, again, I've already kind of been working with, so it, it kind of intuitively knew what tracks to pull up into individual channels. Um, but if you click on each, each channel now, that this is a selectable field, and you can, it will show you all of the wave files that are in this folder. And so you can actually set up whatever wave file you want to be played back through whatever channel you want when it gets to the mixer. Um, so again, this is just a really, really cool use of this utility here. Now I'm gonna pick a destination, which will be my E drive again. That's the drive that I'm gonna be connecting to my mixer. Now I'm gonna name this. I'll name this brown bottle play. Um, and I, I can tell it what kind of mixer I'm using. So this is a TouchMix 30 that I'm going to be using. If I'm using a 16 or an eight, you have those options there. So you can select those appropriately to tell it, you know, how many, what's your channel count and what mixer it's going to be played back on. Uh, and then just like that, just like before, if I want to get all of my channels, I can hit all, or if there's, if there's only a few that I want to pull up, you know, on, whoops, none, on specific channels on the mixer, I can just make my selections to those tracks and make my, selection of which wave files I want to be played back on those channels, whatever it may be. And then I hit export, I confirm, and then I get the same, I should get the same thinking. There we go. Now it is now writing all of those files into a new session on my drive, which will be able to be played back. Again, I have already done this. I'm going to cancel this at this time so we don't have to wait for that. Um, and I'm going back to that drive here. So I've got my drive selected. And if I look at brown bottle playback here, that's the I, that's those same tracks from that same folder. I did the same thing. I exported them earlier. Um, so I could already have them ready to show you. If I click in here, now I have all my individual track files. And in those files, I have the appropriate WAV file to be played back. So that's it. That's as simple as that. Um, it's very easy to use and it's very easy to, to get files transferred between your mixer and your DAW and your computer or whatever you need to do. Um, so there you go. That is uh, the ins and outs of USB hard drive recording uh, and the DAW utility. I uh, would love to hear any questions you guys have at this time, if there are any. Um, Jason, yeah, we've got one uh, that you could probably assist with. So with the import utility, um, it has a drop down for regions recorded under the same track. Mm -hmm. um, but he's never been able to import just one region. So he's saying it's all or nothing. Is yeah, it is all it, it, it is all or nothing okay. uh, on the export. So yeah, any any it finds all of the tracks or all the files that are recorded in every channel or any channel that you select and it just grabs all of them. It will give them, it will number them though when it, when it exports them. So it'll, it'll apply whatever name they had in the mixer and then it'll just say one, two, three, you know, that track one, two, three, four, however many you have in there. So it, it, it'll, it'll num number them. So they're still differentiated, but yeah, it's uh, it is sort of a batch export. Absolutely. I think that's all we got in the uh, Q and A at least uh, at this time. Okay. Well, cool. That, uh, that was pretty smooth. I thought hopefully that that was good for you guys. Hopefully you're able to follow that. Um, and if there are no questions, uh, that's, that's the, that's the show. That's, that's the spiel that kind of got us through the process here. Um, hopefully you learned something, uh, definitely get out. If you have a mixer, um, get on this thing, start recording. Um, and it's, you know, it's, it's a really, really, really useful tool to be able to, to, to utilize it, to capture your performances and then mix them down, get them into your software, mix them down that way, you know, go back and forth. So the, you know, the power of having the option to record uh, really kind of elevates this thing beyond just its live mixer capabilities. Um, that's just kind of what I wanted to, to show off to you guys. So I appreciate everybody for logging on and hanging out with us for the last hour or so. Uh, again, I hope this was helpful. Hope this was useful. Hope you learned something and um, keep an eye out for the recording. If you want to watch any of this back again, uh, you should be receiving the link to the recording sometime tomorrow afternoon. All right. Well, thanks again, guys. And uh, we'll say, we'll say sayonara. <laughs>